I'm going to start out by proposing uh, the figure of the drone, or more specifically the logics it exemplifies, that's why I've got this title Drone Logic, as a means of thinking about how information collection works in an, in an increasingly sensor-driven context of mediated interactivity. Um, so I, I think that one of the reasons, my, this is kind of speculative, uh, that the figure of the drone has so rapidly captured the popular and media imagination is that in addition to um, reviving what might be described as the ballistic imaginary once associated with technological gadgetry, uh, I'm thinking of this kind of, you know, remember the popular science imagination of the 1950s that, that you know, it was all about stuff flying around. Uh, and it turned out we went in a different direction. It became much more about information. But drones kind of bring back that, that uh, kind of communication combined with transport um, sensibility. But I think the other thing going on there is that um, drones encapsulate the emerging logic of portable, always-on, distributed, ubiquitous, and automated information capture. So th this, uh, those are the types of things I'm trying to get at when I'm using the figure of the drone to think about some broader logics of, of information capture. The promise of the drone is, as hyper-efficient information technology is, I'd argue, it at least fourfold. I think it has these dimensions. It extends and multiplies the reaches of the senses. It saturates the times and spaces in which sensing takes place. Entire cities can be photographed 24 hours a day, which is why, of course, it becomes a big data issue as well. Um, it automates the sense-making process. Uh, once you've got big data, you need forms of automated analytics to process it and it automates response. Uh, it brings those things together, information processing and, and response. Um, you, you may know historically, if you talk about the current, you know, the history of drones can go back quite far, but if you think of the current um, iteration of drones in the predator mode, uh, the immediate precursors of those drones were surveillance drones. Uh, and um, they were, you know, extension of the senses in terms of monitoring. But what they found out was that response time became an issue. Once you, for military purposes, once you detected something that you wanted to respond to, then you had to call in some type of military response. Uh, and then one of the solutions was to weaponize the drones, right? So you could have automated detection and automated resp or uh, quick response built into the, into the same device. Uh, in this regard, the figure of the drone unites ballistic and information technology. It's not simply a weaponized camera. This is only one modality in which the logic of the drone manifests itself. And I don't just mean, you know, pizza delivery and Amazon.com delivery, uh, but also I'm going to make an argument that devices that we don't really think of as, as drones um, participate in what I'm calling drone logic. So I, I'm going to spend some time doing that. Uh, the drone is an indefinitely expandable probe that foregrounds the relationship between automated data capture and algorithmic decision making. It's a telling fact, for example, that drones have become notoriously associated with the so-called signature strike, uh, about which you may have heard, an attack based on the detection of a particular and publicly unspecified profile of behavior that allegedly identifies insurgent or terrorist activity. Here I'm talking about military use of drones in, in theaters like Afghanistan. Um, we might describe this as the emergence of a semi-automated attack algorithm, facilitated by the fact that the device can be used to simultaneously collect information uh, that helps determine the appropriate data signature and then to act on it uh, um, immediately. The decision-making process isn't yet fully automated, but the algorithmic character of the decision-making process is summed up in this a notion of a signature strike. Signature strike is opposed to a personality strike, right? A signature strike takes, takes place based not on the identification of, of known individuals, you don't ID them, um, but on the probabilistic logic of, a, of the profile. The observed behavior has the signature of terrorist or insurgent activity. Uh, most recently, just a couple of weeks ago, you may have seen some of the investigative reports that came out that Glenn, Green, Glenn Greenwald and, and um, I think his name is Jeremy Scahill did. Uh, they revealed that, quote, the National Security Agency is using complex analysis of electronic surveillance rather than human intelligence, and by that they mean human recognition of individuals, as the primary method to locate targets for lethal drone strikes. 
according to a former drone operator for the military's um, Joint Special Operation Command, who also worked with the NSA, uh, the agency often identifies targets based on metadata analysis and cell phone tracking technologies. Rather than confirming a target's identity with operatives or informants on the ground, the CIA or the US military orders a strike based either on signature activity or one of the other techniques that they've been using is addressable mobile devices. It gives addressability a kind of new meaning, uh, but SIM cards of, the, of the phones who are associated with particular individuals. Uh, so this is, this is just a, a short step away, I think, from automated forms of response. Uh, and they are talking about lethal autonomous robots. So, uh, that's one, one of the uh, areas of research when it comes to, to the development of drone technology. This logic of automated algorithmic or device specific targeting is an increasingly familiar one in the realm of data mining more generally, whether for the purposes of healthcare, surveillance, marketing, policing, or security. Identif identification can take a back seat to data analytics. analytics. You don't need to know the name of a particular individual to target him or her. Um, uh, merely that he or she fits the target profile or is associated with an identified addressable device. One of the things I'm arguing for then is a broader reading of the figure of the drone in which the logics of mobility, sensing, ubiquity, and automation coalesce. I'd, I'd probably put networking in there. Uh, the drone comes to stand as a contemporary icon of the interface of new forms of monitoring and surveillance, an exemplar of the always-on, networked, mobile, distributed sensing device. The reference to the figure of the drone is, is necessarily infrastructural. This is why I think it's interesting. Um, it refers not just to the sensing device, not just to the interface, but to the architecture of information collection, transmission, analysis, and response for which it is the visible face, or maybe the not so visible interface. Consider, for example, an account of the frustration of one of the generals who helped oversee the development of the Predator drone. He's grown so weary, this is from a news report about him, uh, he's grown so weary of fascination with the vehicle itself, the, you know, the flying thing, that he's adopted the slogan, it's about the data link, stupid. Uh, and I think that's a useful um, slogan for, th for th thinking about uh, the political economy or the operation of, of drone logic. The drone, like the sensors distributed across the network digital landscape, is a conduit. And as the same news account puts it, following up on this general's account, quote, cut off from its back end, from its satellite links and its data processors, the intelligence analysts and its controller, the, drain is as the drone is as useless as an eyeball disconnected from the brain. Popular discussions of big data, data mining, and new forms of monitoring and surveillance uh, often emphasize the figure of the cloud rather than that of the infrastructure that makes data collection possible. In the conference, we've, we've talked a fair amount about the analytics uh, and, and, um, and the data processing, but not so much, maybe a little bit also, but not so much about the infrastructure, right? Huge server farmers, satellite uplinks, all of the uh, physical material infrastructure that makes possible the, the collection and the processing of, of the information. Um, I think the, f the focus on the, on the cloud is in part because of the distributed and heterogeneous character of the various sensors that comprise the monitoring assemblage. Tracing all the different devices and infrastructures is a complicated affair. But it's also in part because of what might be described as the, as the turn away from infrastructure that's characterized the fascination with the so-called immaterial forms of data, uh, sorry, or immaterial forms of activity f um, uh, that are associated with digitization and datafication. The figure of the drone focuses attention, uh, this is one of the reasons it interests me, back on the interface device and serves as a, a, a media, uh, sorry, the device that serves as mediator for both information collection and a certain type of automated action or response at a distance. Instead of the airy, light, unfettered figure of the cloud as the face of new forms of data capture, storage, and response, I'm proposing this kind of more intrusive, tethered figure of, of the drone. And it's with this broader conception in mind that we might explore the ways in which the logic of distributed, efficient, portable, uh, the distributed, efficient, portable probe can be generalized across the landscape of digital interactivity. Among other connotations, the name drone conjures up the image of a continuous background presence. 
and much hinges on the ability to, to establish an always-on presence that lends itself to both surveillance and the perpetual warfare associated with the so-called war on terror, but also with the new forms of always-on relationship monitoring that characterize the digital economy. As Edward Snowden, among others, has taught us, these logics are two sides of the same coin in, in a lot of ways. So I'm going to turn to a couple of more concrete examples of what I mean by the generalization of drone logic. I'm hoping these might be fruitful in the sense that um, uh, if, if you find the analysis compelling, you might think of other examples of the, of the way in which this works, and I hope there might be something fruitful about that. Uh, so a couple of examples. Um, first is, is a public sector example from the US Department of Homeland Security. From its inception, um, it's relied on crowdsourcing, on crowdsourcing campaigns, and there's a whole set of logics around this. You know, wh when threat is distributed in particular ways, then you have to m responsibilize the populace uh, um, in order to address it. Uh, and you may remember there, uh, the types of campaigns. Uh, there was something similar here. I remember seeing the posters when I first got here back in 2007. Um, uh, the logic of mobilizing the populace in, in the face of a threat that gets framed as ubiquitous and, ubiquitous and perpetual, a strike that could take place virtually anywhere along a growing variety of threat vectors. And um, a, a, what I see as a kind of development in that form of crowdsourcing is a program they're developing called the Sell All Program uh, that automates the crowdsourcing process by embedding sensors in smartphones to detect toxic chemicals and eventually other threats and report them directly to the authorities. As the DHS publicity puts it, Cell All regular, regularly sniffs, they, they develop these chemical sensors. They're trying to make them as small and portable as possible and, and, and put them in all of the, uh, eventually, in the cell phones that are produced in, uh, for distribution in the United States. Um, uh, it regularly, this is the quote, regularly sniffs the surrounding air for certain volatile chemical compounds. When a threat is sensed, a virtual achu ensues. If the threat is a personal safety issue, uh, some kind of immediate undetectable threat, such as high levels of toxic carbon monoxide, the phone sounds an alert for the user, so it automatically notifies you. Uh, however, for catastrophes, and this is a quote, such as sarin, sarin gas attacks, details are phoned home to an emergency operations center, while also presumably sounding a warning signal, one hopes. Um, so, uh, so, you know, the idea is once you opt in or, you know, activate the app, it's just sniffing all the time. And as soon as it detects anything that registers as a hit, it automatically sends a signal back to uh, headquarters. Um, the goal is to piggyback on the proliferation of smartphones to create a massively distributed mobile sensor array that goes wherever people do, casting a wider net than stationary sensors can. Once you opt into the system, the response is automated. Interactivity becomes, in a sense, passive. Uh, Slavoj Žižek has used this term, the philosopher, interpassivity. He uses it in a completely different way, but uh, it, it, it maybe starts to capture the way sensors operate in, in this interactive register. Um, uh, anywhere a chemical threat breaks out, a mall, a bus, a subway, or office, cell all will alert the authorities automatically. Detection, identification, and notification all take place in less than 60 seconds. And here you start to hear, uh, I'll say a little bit about pushing in this kind of direction of, um, that Gavin had talked about a little bit earlier uh, in today, pushing beyond the human. Uh, because the data are delivered digitally, cell all reduces the chances of human error. The infrastructure for what Bill Gates once called friction-free capitalism redoubles itself in this figure of frictionless securitization. Bill e Gates had this idea that, and, and, and again, it's this kind of automated response that, you know, your computer would figure out the kind of things that you liked, and if you authorized it, would actually start buying them for you. <laughs> because he was, he was really frustrated by humans. Uh, you can kind of see why. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a kind of post-human guy. Like, uh, all these things are much nicer if information flows perfectly. But it was this immediate um, infra data collection and response. Uh, and that's what he meant uh, by friction-free capitalism. You could kind of lubricate these paths. But this is a kind of frictionless securitization. Um, the friction in both cases is provided by humans, users. So this is a quote from the sell-all literature. Quote, currently if a person suspects that something is amiss, they might dial 911, 
though behavioral science tells us that it's easier just to do nothing. If, they, uh, if he must do something, it may be at a risk to his own life. And as is often in the case when someone phones in an emergency, the caller may be frantic and difficult to understand, presumably unlike you know, the clean data provided by the, uh, by the phone. In contrast, the automated response of distributed probes bypasses the shortcomings of their human bearers, whose senses might not even be able to detect the threat that permeates their environment. All of which isn't to discount the potential benefits of such a system, but rather to point out the logic that links them to broader strategies uh, for, loca for um, locative media-enabled automated sensing, information processing, and, and response. The Sell All project builds and reflects on an understanding of interactivity that characterizes the commercial use of distributed digital devices. They're not simply portable content sharing and communication devices, but also mobile probes that allow for new forms of centralized or quasi-centralized information collection and processing. The devices harness users' movements and in turn provide location-specific data for centralized response. In this context, the humans that carry them might be conceptualized as their propulsion devices uh, that allow the probes to circulate in populated spaces according to the rhythms of human activity. Taken to the limit, the sell-all network is meant to be coextensive with the communication network, you know, to, to be an overlay on it. As the DHS publicity puts it, the scheme, quote, envisions a chemical sensor in every cell phone, in every pocket, purse, or belt holster. Or, as the technical director for the Homeland Security Advanced Research Projects Agency put it, it used to be DARPA, now I guess it's HASARPA, uh, uh, what we're trying to do here is make chemical sensors part of the fabric of society. I think that's a really interesting quote, uh, just kind of the fabric of, of daily life. This saturation of, daily, of the spaces of daily life uh, is in some ways, I, I'd argue, also the logic of the drone, not an event-driven, discrete form of monitoring, but a continuous background presence, able to detect threat where and when it happens. The conceptual structure of this kind of distributed remote sensing is flexible and expandable depending on the development of new sensing technology. The mobile phone, like the drone more generally, or maybe the other way around, can be equipped with a growing array of sensors to enable a proliferating range of activities that go beyond national security, narrowly construed to encompass healthcare, agriculture, commerce, and so on. Uh, as, as the HASARPA, uh, the director of HASARPA, Homeland Security Advanced Research Project uh, Administration, put it. There are a million and one uses for this. They're very excited about this capability. Uh, it's relatively in inexpensive. It's, uh, uh, it has a potentially um, quite, quite dramatic data collection powers. So I'm going to switch now to a, a second example, and then I'm going to come back and, and make some uh, you know, more theoretical claims about what's going on here. Um, but the, the second example is, is a uh, commercial example, unsurprisingly. Um, sorry, I, d I don't think I've actually got a slide for this one. Um, the, uh, one of the current frontiers of smartphone sensing is that of so-called affective computing. And it's interesting, a affect has been one of the things that throughout, uh, every now and then it's kind of come up in the background as something that's um, tricky to get at, or, or how, wh what are the ways in which you might detect it or measure it. Uh, of, of course, there's a whole register of, uh, of computer research that's devoted to, to this notion of affective computing, the attempt to gather information about users, users' emotional states based on interactively generated data. In this regard, we might describe mobile phones, uh, at least as construed through the researchers I'm going to talk about, as always on mood probes circulating amongst the populace in order to harvest useful affective data for purposes ranging from marketing to academic research to therapy and healthcare. As one group of researchers has put it, quote, smartphones are ubiquitous, unobtrusive, and sensor-rich computing devices carried by billions of users every day. More importantly, owners are likely to forget their presence, allowing for passive and effortless collection of data streams that capture user behavior. The goal of such applications is to integrate themselves into the fabric of daily life so that the information collection process becomes both omnipresent and invisible. Apple has already patented technology that relies on an embedded tactile 
Uh, this is just a patent. I, I don't know whether they've developed it yet. Uh, heart, it's, a, it's an embedded heartbeat sensor that can be used to identify users, you know, I guess in conjunction with or as an alternative to, let's say, something like fingerprints, um, so they claim, but also to monitor their moods. The technology combines the promise of convenience with enhanced monitoring capability. The phone can be unlocked just by picking it up and, and your unique heartbeat fingerprint is detected. Uh, but the monitor, unlike, say, a fingerprint scanner, also gathers information that can serve a host of marketing, security, and medical functions. As one news account put it, by monitoring your heartbeats, the device will be able to tell you how you're feeling, what you've been eating, and if you've just come back from a jog. The vectors for approaching mood uh, uh, detection are multiple and expanding alongside the various registers of interactivity. They piggyback on other applications to generate correlations with expressed mood, heart rate monitoring, skin conductance, and voice stress analysis incorporated into new voice interfaces. For example, the company that developed the technology that powers Siri, Apple's Siri, is um, uh, working on adding voice recognition ID systems uh, so that Siri will be able to recognize stress in your voice uh, and to gauge your, uh, your affect and respond accordingly. Um, uh, this is, they're also working on systems for automobiles. Uh, soon Siri will respond not just to what you say but to its conception of how you feel, or at least that's the claim. Once again, the promise combines convenience with the prospect, at least in this case, of commercial monitoring. As a press account of an interview with the company's marketing chief put it, and this is for the automotive app that they're developing, if your car thinks you sound stressed, it may SMS your office to say you're late, or even automatically suggest another route that avoids traffic. Or, they didn't put this in, but you could imagine a variety of other things, play a certain type of music, maybe it starts to massage you. Um, but the company is looking to monetize the technology. What if when you ask Siri for information about a movie, she works out that you're sad and recommends a comedy film that you otherwise wouldn't have seen, paired with an ad campaign. Well, that's how, these, that's how they, they're thinking. That's their quote, not, not mine. Uh, and, and the litany of mood apps goes on. MIT has spun off a company called Affectiva that uses facial recognition technology uh, to gauge emotional response. It's been used by companies like Forbes to crowdsource readers' responses to ads shown on the company's website. Uh, there's a company called Sensum that uses galvanic skin response to measure sweat levels. Microsoft is adding emotion recognition into the Kinect device so that next-gen games and perhaps ads will be able to react to facial expressions and monitor heart rate. The anticipated response is, as one somewhat breathless account puts it, that games will react to your emotionality and even your cars will route you to entirely new destinations based on how you're feeling. Uh, this isn't, I guess, literally an affective turn. <laughs> so you're going down the road. We're going to take an affective turn now, <laughs> based on how you feel. Uh, the next generation of advertising will determine how you're feeling. And it's not just a question of detecting your mood. It's all about how this leads the person expressing the mood to discover new information. And of course, to more effectively sort, target, and influence in a variety of registers for a range of purposes. Security, of course, is one of the pioneering and more, and more exploratory ones. The DHS has founded Cambridge-based Draper Labs to, quote, develop computerized sensors capable of detecting a person's level of malintent or intention to do harm as part of the future attribute screening technologies programs that they've got. Um, sorry. Uh, the goal is to detect subjects' bad intentions by monitoring their physiological characteristics, particularly those associated with fear and anxiety. As part of a broader initiative to develop so-called non-invasive technologies to screen people at security checkpoints. Possible technological features of FAST, future attribute screening technology, include, quote, a remote cardiovascular and respiratory sensor to measure heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, and respiratory sinus arrhythmia. I guess that just means breathing irregularly. Uh, a remote eye tracker that uses a camera and processing software to track the position and gaze of the eyes, and in some instances, the entire head. Thermal cameras that provide detailed information on the changes in the thermal properties of the skin in the face, presumably correlated with um, certain types of emotions. And a, a high-resolution video that allows for highly detailed images of the face and body. 
an audio system for analyzing human voice uh, for pitch change. The project is based on another DHS project called Hostile Intent, which aims to identify facial expressions, gait, blood, pressure, pulse, and perspiration rates that are characteristic of hostility or the desire to deceive." Unquote. Under the purview of DHS's Advanced Research Projects Agency, again, the project would include heart rate and breathing sensors, infrared light, laser, video, audio, and eye tracking. So they've got a bunch of this stuff online. As far as I can tell, it's uh, um, uh, in, still in development. Some of, some of you may know more about this. Uh, one company claims to be able to listen in on mobile phone conversations to identify a person's emotional state. This adds a kind of another dimension to the type of metadata tracking that, that we've been hearing about. Some companies in the United States already use the system in their call centers to gauge customers' level of stress. Uh, the company is testing the software's use in diagnosing medical conditions like autism, schizophrenia, heart disease, uh, and even for some forms of cancer. You could go on and on in this register. I, I, what I wanted to highlight was that dimension of, that, that frontier of um, uh, technological innovation in the, in the affective register. You know, we've been talking a lot about forms of data collection that are, are in a somewhat different register, you know, collecting data about transactional information, for example. And this is, this is looking in a somewhat different direction. And I just, it, it, it looks like it's going to be one of the areas that um, people are staking a lot of uh, investment and, and perhaps um, some speculative hope in terms of its productivity. Uh, the interest, and, and I'm going to get back to the drone question uh, with this second example I wanted to talk about. The interest in the affective register is based not simply on its novelty, but also on contemporary theories of influence and decision making associated with developments in neuroscience facilitated by new brain imaging technologies. Marketers, for example, are particularly interested in affective states and influences because of the impact these might have on consumption decisions. Moreover, because of the positive role of affective response in providing users with a shortcut through the welter of available information and simultaneously offering marketers a way to cut through the, the clutter of ads, uh, right, so on, on both ends, you know, your affective response can serve as a guide to help you negotiate a kind of overflow of messaging. And marketers can use that response as a way of reading whether or not they've cut through all of the competition. There's increasing interest in the possibility that mood might help play an important role in the forms of filtering that help consumers navigate a growing array of choices. Uh, that I, I know somebody, for example, who's, who does research on um, uh, recommendation algorithms. So uh, com companies like Pandora, I don't know if you know, you know that, what, what would be an equivalent that's available here? Um, it's music streaming, but it streams music based to you based on your stated preferences. So you kind of designate what you like, and then it, it serves music to you. Uh, and he's looking at how those algorithms work and, the, and talking to the people who develop them. And one of the main things they're trying to sort out is, is uh, the affective register. Is there a way we can tailor these musical recommendations or the flow of music to perceived mood? Um, the, pro the proliferation of in information generated by social media sites of one kind or another has opened up new fields of data for mining sentiment, mood, and effective response, leading to the rise of so-called sentiment analysis. We haven't heard much about that uh, so far. I, I wonder if that's, um, I don't know if that's dead ending or uh, people are going off in other directions. Um, but, you know, part of the social media phenomenon was, was the fact that not only was a whole lot of um, information about what people did online available, but also there was an explosion of information about people's reactions, their moods, the, you know, the types of things that were the expressive component of the data that they posted on Facebook and Twitter. And I think that spawned this indus industry of, uh, of um, sentiment analysis startups. In other words, mood is an important realm of data collection and monitoring for a range of applications and institutions, underwriting uh, this uh, ongoing process of, of thinking about the ways in which populations uh, can serve as distributed probes, uh, or at least the technology that, that, uh, that interacts with them can treat them as a certain type of probe. The combination of smartphones monitoring capabilities with the resurgent interest in affective interfaces 
has led, not surprisingly, I think, to attempts to use smartphones as mood detectors. And this is the second example I wanted to talk about. Microsoft researchers have developed a smartphone software system dubbed MoodScope. This is just from the paper that they've uh, put together on it. Um, that infers users' emo emotional states by monitoring usage patterns. And the insight here is that, um, you know, rather than having to go the direct route of um, measuring something biometrically in order to, to try to get at mood, that y you gather so much data about patterns of use and patterns behavior of behavior on a device that's with you, you know, for most of your waking hours, that you could actually look for correlations that would allow other patterns of behavior uh, to, to indicate mood. And so what they did was uh, they, spent it, they spent two months tracking users and correlating patterns of, of smartphone use with self-reported mood. Uh, you know, that may have its own issues. Uh, but after doing that, then they, then they started to develop techniques for um, bypassing self-report and directly inferring mood and then they correlated that back to self-report and they claimed that, that after doing some corrections they were able to, at least for the, for the population of users that, that were equipped with this device, they were able to infer the mood of individual users accurately 93% of the time, which seems quite amazing. Uh, well, I guess it depends on how they define mood. The system is based on the fact that as the researchers put it, people use their smartphone differently when they are in different mood states. MoodScope attempts to leverage these patterns by learning about its users and associating usage patterns with particular moods. Who you email, what websites you go to, I don't know, what type of music you listen to, what, so on. Uh, the virtue of their approach, as the researchers describe it, echoes some of the key attributes of the sell-all program. It runs in the background and operates passively without users having to input mood information or provide any data other than that generated by the normal daily use of their phones. Quote, the smartphone component runs silently as a background service. Uh, and this is a big factor. It consumes minimal power and doesn't impact other smartphone applications. So you, know, you, you don't have to have a dedicated app that's uh, actually draining the battery. It, it just piggybacks on what's there. Uh, the stated goal of the development of mood monitoring capabilities is to assist communication uh, they, they came up with a number of reasons, but one of them was by adding mood awareness to mediated forms of interaction. You know, the type of thing that you've heard about email, uh, the problem, the email is just one dimensional, you can't convey certain forms of affect in it, or people you try to with emoticons or exclamation points and so on. Um, but their idea was, you know, how can, how can you reintroduce uh, some elements of, of um, emotion in, into these mediated forms of communication in particular ways. Uh, so they came up with this idea of helping to provide users with services and communications that are targeted not just to their behavior, to their interests and their location, but also to their mood, if you think of the different dimensions of targeting that are proliferating these days. As the Microsoft researchers put it, when mood is integrated into mediated forms of communication, such as email and texting platforms and even telephony, users would be able to better know how and what to communicate with others. They imagine the possibility that mood data will be made available to interlocutors prior to their engaging in communication. I guess if you activate the app. Uh, we will know if a friend is sad, so we can call him or her to cheer them, cheer them up. We will know if a supervisor is in a bad mood as we craft an email response to him or her. These are their examples, and so on. In an era of media overload, mood serves as one more input into filtering systems that help us navigate the information landscape. With mood scope, for example, quote, video search could filter results to best match the user's mood. Uh, of course, marketers will be interested in mood data as well, not uh, insignificant to Microsoft. Uh, as they put it, the researchers put it, quote, mood plays a significant role in our lives, influencing our behavior, driving social communication, and shifting our consumer preferences. The goal of this type of location, uh, locational media uh, mood tracking to put it a little bit more bluntly, is to mobilize the effective register as a more effective avenue of influence. So with those two examples in mind, and I, I hope that, you know, hope kind of framing it that way, you, there might be other ways in which you could think of kind of distributed networked forms of information collection and, and, and response that might fit that logic. 
I'm not saying all these things are drones, right? I'm saying that the drone, there's certain elements of the logic of drone that you can abstract that might, uh, that you can f find replicated across the, the interactive landscape. And that the drone is a kind of maybe an organizing figure for thinking about those logics. The invocation of, of this figure leads to a consideration of recent theoretical developments. So I'm going to make some kind of theory-oriented claims here uh, that illuminate the forms of knowing associated with data collection in the era of distributed mobile interactive devices. Take, for example, the forms of mood monitoring associated with, with things like cell all and the other examples. Um, the incannabula incannabulum of the era of so-called affective computing might be described as the attempt to imagine uh, the devices with which we interact is increasingly human, not cold calculating machines, but communicative prostheses that can respond to a growing range of feelings, moods, and emotions. Once upon a time, developments in machine learning and artificial intelligence were framed in these terms as an attempt to tear down the distinctions that have been used to separate human from machine, to imagine how computers might take on the attributes of humanness. Recent developments in theory, however, I think, push in a, in a different anti-anthropocentric direction, highlighting the ways not in which machines are, uh, can be kind of humanized, but the ways in which humans can be understood more broadly as one more collection of things in the great object world. Jane Bennett's version of vibrant materialism, for example, that's been quite influential in some of the areas that, that I work in, extends agentic capacity to things with the goal, uh, to things with the goal of including, quote, non-humans in the demos. Ian Bogost's version of, quote, object-oriented ontology performs a similar leveling of being in his embrace of what he calls a flat ontology that espouses, quote, the abandonment of anthropocentric narrative coherence in favor of worldly detail. Such approaches work to overcome the opposition between subject and object from the side of the object. Bennett, for example, intentionally gives short shrift to subjectivity in order to focus on the active powers that, as she puts it, issue from non-subjects. The anti-anthropocentric goal is to displace the human subject in favor of agentive capacity, something that objects can have as well, according to Bennett, insofar as they can interact with one another in ways that have consequences. Bogost retains the subject, but redefines it into oblivion. Uh, quote, the philosophical subject must cease to be limited to humans and things that influence humans. Instead, it must become everything, full stop. This, uh, this direction of theory, I think, bears a, a kind of affinity to Bennett's passion for complexification. Uh, the, f the, f the familiar accounts of social theory tend to stop too soon, she claims, not because they focus on human subjects in their interactions, but because once you expand the field to include the entire object world, it enfolds indefinitely, vertiginously, becomes uh, kind of indefinitely complex, which is quite, I, I guess, familiar if, if you start thinking about it through questions of data collection and all of the different variables that, that you might uh, introduce to a particular situation. Such approaches, despite whatever progressive claims they might imagine themselves to license. And I bring them up because I, I think they, they kind of have a theory, you know, they're like, they're like the th ideologists of drone logic. <laughs> that, that's why, I, so, so I'm, try, I'm trying to think of, you know, kind of what's, what, what's the way of the thinking, what's the form of thinking that underwrites uh, uh, the automation of, of data collection and, and data response? Um, I don't know, but that, you might, push me on that, but um, I hope there's something useful there. Uh, I think these approaches align themselves with what I would call the, um, the anti-narrative logic of drone sensing and the analytic operations of the data mine. And what I mean by that is um, the, f the forms of automated response that, that we've been, uh, uh, automated kind of collection processing and response that have, we've been talking about for the past couple of days, um, uh, often work in a direction that moves beyond a story. We're not trying to tell a story. It's not even clear that, um, uh, there's, uh, that we're gesturing in the direction of a narrative that can be verified or not. Uh, what, what's happening is a certain kind of processing of details um, uh, and, and responding to them in real time. Uh, indeed, Bogos' fascination with the endless expansion of detail, illustrated by his passion for lists, rehearses the omnivorous appetite of the database. I'm, I, 
I think of this kind of theory as drone theory because their versions of agency and experience seem to fit with those associated with the distributed network of data sensing probes enabled by the development of locative media technologies. <coughs> it would be harder to effectively outline the attributes of, of the, these kind of activities of the drones that I'm talking about without the vocabulary provided by these approaches. From a perspective in which experience and action and the relationship between the two is desubjectivized, uh, we can trace some of the salient aspects of drone thinking broadly construed. I'm, try I'm trying to think of what, I g well, I, maybe I'll give some examples here will help make sense of that. But, you know, think about that, the type of response to the signature strike, which has been, you know, you don't, you haven't identified these people. You, ha you, you, don't, you don't know who they are. You don't really have a, a um, I don't know, some kind of a, a backstory about them. What you have is a pattern, uh, and, and that's a pattern that's generated by whatever types of sensors that you have available, and that's what you respond to. It's not about um, some type of a reference to a story in the real world that can be verified. I mean, it is in the sense when you question it, <laughs> but in, in its operation, it has maybe a slightly different logic. The experience of the drone is the experience of things, as summed up in Bogost's broadened definition. He, des he describes it this way, the experience of things can be characterized only by tracing the exhaust of their effects on the surrounding world. Somebody brought up data exhaust earlier, right? But th 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 it's that connection that intrigued me. That is, things can only experience other things by tracing their exhaust, and their own experience is simply whatever reaction they have to that exhaust, a reaction that generates further exhaust, multiplying the available data. All internal aspects of, aspects of experience associated with accounts of intentionality, motivation, and desire fall by the wayside in a formulation that recalls Chris Anderson's P into the power of big data. I think Gavin uh, referenced this earlier. As he puts it, this is a kind of controversial piece about how data mining displaces theory. Um, out with every theory of human behavior from linguistics to sociology, forget taxonomy, ontology, and psychology. Who knows why people and things do what they do? The point is they do it, and we can track and measure it with unprecedented fidelity. Uh, there are echoes of this signature strike in there. Um, I, 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 this isn't really in, in the talk that I'd prepared, but I, I was thinking about the way police procedurals have shifted. You know, it, like think of if you're old enough to remember back to the days of well, like Columbo or, uh, you know, how these, how these detective shows worked, and then you compare them to the CSI world, you know, it's like so different. You know, in Columbo, Columbo, that's, is, that's right, yeah, the, Peter Falk, yeah, uh, you know, there's a whole narrative that gets constructed uh, and, you, you know, you try to figure out the story. Whereas in CSI, the narrative is, is completely, uh, there is a narrative, but it's, it's tertiary or it doesn't matter. You know, what matters is, is, you know, like a kind of cool detection device in a machine that can read what molecule is, you know, it's all about these kind of traces in this data. And, and the story is just kind of uh, an afterthought or, or an alibi for that. I, I, that is pushing in that direction of what I'm thinking is a, a certain type of post-narrative logic. Um, I guess Anderson's is, is clearer, you know. Uh, um, we don't need theories, We've, we have the data. Uh, and he says a little bit later on in that piece, with enough, number, with enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, I know that that's a fallacy, but it's, it's, it's that way of thinking that intrigues me. Uh, does the case study of the mood sensing probe belie such an account? This is the uh, Microsoft stuff. Because it, it seems to be attempting to get at some kind of inner experience. You know, what's your mood? How are you feeling today? Uh, that's unique to human subjects, right? Uh, um, that affective register. But, uh, but, you know, maybe from the point of view of inner subjective human applications, like communicating with your boss when he or she might be angry. Or, uh, uh, but when it comes to the real application that I think Microsoft cares about, I don't think it really operates that way. There, there's a story about inner experience, but the notion of mood doesn't have any really substantive content. I, I think it's more a placeholder between two correlations, um, one that can eventually be d dispensed with. If a particular pattern of smartphone use correlates with a particular stated mood, and that mood in turn is associated with a heightened probability of response, for example, to a certain marketing appeal, um, that mood is just a placeholder to get from that one section to the other. It's not about, you know, knowing who you are and how you're feeling. Uh, and it would eventually be possible to jump straight from the pattern of use to the change in response, right? You don't, you don't need the mood except as a, 
I guess a heuristic device to, or, or to get you to, from one to the other. Uh, so the, the distinction between experience and reaction collapses. In this regard, we might consider the implications of reconstituting the subject as drone or human forms of droning. Uh, an echo of this, I, I like these examples. They're, they're <laughs> I, I, they seem just suggest suggestive to me. Um, an echo of this incipient, incipi sorry, incipient privileging of the post-human resounds in recent coverage of automated military systems, or so-called lethal auto autonomous robots. The basic conceit behind a lethal auto autonomous robot is that it can outperform and outthink a human operator. Uh, as one university researcher put it, in what sounds almost like a parody, quote, if a drone system is sophisticated enough, it could be less emotional, more selective, and able to provide force in a way that achieves a tactical objective with the least harm. A lethal autonomous robot can aim better, target better, select better, and in general be a better asset uh, with the linked ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance packages it can run. The same logic can be turned around on humans themselves through the process of what might be described as, as droning, envisioning people as distributed, networked sensing devices. Consider, for example, uh, again, this is um, Homeland Security Advanced Research Projects Administration. Uh, they've funded something called cortically coupled computer vision systems that seek to make human image scanners more efficient by noticing, uh, by noticing for them the brain responses that they don't consciously register, or not for them, for, uh, for a third party. So here's the problem. Drones generate so much photographic information that it's hard to get within budgetary constraints enough people to watch it, right? So, uh, so that pushes in two directions. One is automated forms of, of um, you know, pattern recognition. But the second is how can you make human watchers faster and better? And that's what this cortically coupled viewing project does. Uh, so this, the researcher who's involved with this is a guy named Paul Sejda. Um, his goal is to make intelligence analysts, among others, more efficient by bypassing the need for conscious recognition. He claims to be able to show images of drone footage or surveillance satellite photos to analysts more rapidly than they can consciously process uh, in order to use their brain hooked up to EEG monitors as a detection device, a form of sensor. Right? So the idea is they did research and they found out that, uh, you may be familiar with some of this research, you know, you, you have a certain type of affective response and apparently also neurological response prior to your conscious recognition. And apparently it's prior enough to allow you to, to um, accelerate tenfold the speed at which you can be showed photos. So what they do is they show people photos and they're just looking for anomalies in the photos out of the ordinary uh, uh, images. I'm not quite sure how they operationalize that. And, but then they look at what fires in the brain when that, when that anomaly is detected, right? And they look at that before a, a self-report uh, is made. And then they take that information, this is what they claim to be able to do, and then they show the people so, images so fast that they can't consciously register them, but the brain still fires on occasion. <laughs> and then they can use that as, uh, as, a, as a detection system. Um, as Sejda puts it, the system latches onto individual perceptions and trains the computer to know what the user means by interesting or anomalous. Uh, quote, the computer and the brain operate synerg synergistically. Although we might say more accurately that the computer puts the brain to work. The army is reportedly interested in creating a direct interface from drivers' brains to automated forms of reaction and response. So you'd be hooked up with something like this while you're driving, right? And it would be an early warning system. Whatever it is that triggers the warning, you know, that there's going to be a roadside bomb or something, presumably you can, you can accelerate the response if you can figure out what fires in the brain before the driver has to go, wait, something's wrong. What is it? You get the idea. Um, uh, this is a quote about that program. Quote, a driver might see something peculiar on the roadside. Maybe it's an improvised explosive device. His C3 vision headgear would register the brain waves associated with the suspicious object and inject them into the vehicle's driving system. When the system sees, things other, uh, sees other things out there that look similar, it would automatically evade them. Likewise, security guards might use such gear to, sp to spot suspicious activity on surveillance video. Of course, in our convergent world, Consumer applications are envisioned for the same technology. 
Uh, a miniaturized wireless version of the device might be used to tag consumer items and even specialty shops that can catch your fancy as you walk down a city street. I'm not sure, quite sure how that's going to operate, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know how it's going to, maybe your car will just take you, take you where. Um, just a quick glance at a dress in the window, for instance, might elicit a neural firing pattern sufficient to register with the system. A program could then offer up nearby stores selling similar items or shops you might want to investigate. It's, so, it's fascinating to me, this is the other reason why I kind of, I'm interested in the figure of the drone, but how the military applications and the marketing applications they just crop up right next to each other. This is from the same news account right, of, 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 this, uh, of this technology. Um, just combine the technology with Google Glass, this is not me imagining it, uh, and the applications, uh, 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 th this type of applications, and we achieve the fantasy that neuromarketers have been pushing all along, kind of bypassing the friction created by consciousness to gain access to and exploit our quote, real unquote responses, desires, and so on. Uh, a kind of direct feedback system routed through the affective register to bypass self-consciousness altogether. This is not, this is, I, this isn't completely new. I started studying um, smart clothes oh, probably a decade ago. That was, they were quite big in, I don't know, late 90s, early 2000s. Maybe they're coming back. I guess we, the school uniforms that we saw are a form of that. Um, but somebody in the UK was trying to, div to, to invent a suit that would remember what types of stores you liked. And if you were in a big shopping mall that was a new one for you, it would direct you towards those stores based on its memory. Here, I guess you could couple it with your device that it, it would just be you know, based on your neurological response. Uh, but it's really interesting how it directed your body. They did research that discovered that you turn in the direction of heat. So the idea was the suit itself would heat up on one side and that you would, not even consciously, you would just turn in that direction and that the suit could kind of drive you around. I, anyway, I, it's kind of a silly example, but I, I, I want to point out that that, that kind of, that underlying fantasy of a, of a kind of hyper-efficiency um, is, it's continuous. It, it appears in these different manifestations of the technology. Um, so this, this short circuit, this kind of attempt to bypass self-consciousness altogether, highlights the post-subjective character of drone activity, right? Taken to its logical extension, <laughs> this type of direct automated response, uh, the, you know, that I'm suggesting it just one step away, is built into the logic, right? If you can collect the data, if you have the interface there, the, you know, being able to respond instantaneously becomes kind of almost irresistible. Um, Sensors incorporate drone logic when they embrace the sensibility of the agent or actant whose catalyzing activity as framed as ha is framed as having no recur recourse to internal psychological states. Bennett's emphasis on the relationship between the actant and its network is recapitulated by the reminder that the drone slash probe must be understood not in isolation, but in relation to the arrangements of links, data analytics, and control systems within which it's embedded. For Bennett, the appeal of the complexity of the agent network relationship is its emergent character, and thus the challenge it poses to anthropo anthropomorphic forms of intentionalism. When things get really complex, um, it gets very hard to intentionally intervene, or at least that's the story she's telling. Human actors may well intend a certain outcome, but these intentions become caught up in networks they can't master, generating unpredictable, unanticipated, and unintentional outcomes. So she's kind of seeing that as, for her, I think that there's a, I don't know, a certain politics there. I'm, I, 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 I'm not on board with that. I, I'm, it doesn't look politically fruitful to me. But the, the goal of the sensor network that I've been describing is, is, is quite different. It's to harness emergence uh, and to bypass the problems of intentionality, right? By capturing uh, its productivity and placing this in the service of defined ends, predefined ends. Mobile phone networks that collect data from increasingly sophisticated sensor arrays will certainly generate more information that can be made sense of by any individual or group. And in this sense, we'll come to partake of complex arrangements that are, as one recent book put it, too big to know. I, I like this term. I'm not sure I agree with it entirely. I, I, j just a word on this notion of, of too big to know. Uh, um, Lyria's early presentation brought up 
uh, Kate Crawford and Dana Boyd's definition of big data, which I, I think is a good, I like it. The one place where I kind of quibble with them is that, is that mythology of, of big data, because I think they, they lump together two things. One is um, hitherto uh, the, the forms of, I'll say more about this in a second, but, uh, so, but I'll just summarize it briefly. Um, uh, hitherto inaccessible forms of pattern, rec pattern recognition. I think that's true, this type of data mining does that. Uh, but the mythologization part is that this is somehow more a, 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 a superior level of truth or objectivity. There I think um, things get more difficult. But I think you have to separate those two things out. Uh, uh, I think that hitherto inaccessible forms of, of pattern recognition, is. I think that's correct. Um, so the, the legal theorist, when you talk about decisions based on, uh, on this type of data, uh, Talzarski uh, has described the decisions based on, on data mining as, quote, non-interpretable and thus non-transparent because of their inherent complexity. Quote, a non-interpretable pro non process might follow from a data mining analysis, which is not explainable in human language. Here the software makes its selection decisions based upon multiple variables, even thousands. Unquote. However, too big to know doesn't mean too big to use. Automated data collection and automated sense making go hand in hand. When too much data to be absorbed or processed by humans can be collected and stored, the promise of data mining to make the data useful by discerning otherwise inaccessible but nonetheless, uh, sorry, the, the promise of data mining is to make the data useful by discerning otherwise inaccessible but nonetheless useful patterns. The cell phone probe becomes one more agent in a burgeoning and distributed network whose emergent properties can be used to guide and monitor directed, quasi-centralized forms of response. The elements of what I'm here describing as drone theory come to bear on the strategies of information use associated with the huge amounts of data generated by the proliferation of distributed networked interactive devices. Put somewhat differently, the invocation of the figure of the drone serves as shorthand for referring to the automated forms of information collection, processing, and response associated <coughs> with the weaving of mobile devices into the fabric of daily life. If one of the key advances of the development of mobile data is increased specification and thus increased data collection and targeting, or I guess take those th two things together, they simultaneously pose the problem of, of information glut. More specific information about more people more of the time in a growing range of places means a quantum leap in the amount of data collected. The result, as, the figure, as this figure, uh, this notion of drone, drone logic I'm trying to develop here, is the need for increased forms of automation and thus for a shift to the, f to the, m to the forms of um, a post-narrative forms of information use with which these are associated. Both Bennett and Bogost gesture in this direction, although I think it's unintentionally, in their fascination with the proliferation of details and accounts that threaten to overwhelm conventional forms of sense-making. If the thrust of Bennett's account is to highlight how sensitivity to complex networks of human and non-human agents tends to swamp any individual intention, the goal of data mining is, in a sense, to domesticate the complexity, subordin subordinating it to determinate goals, policing, security, profit, the drone network, while participating in the logic of emergence, doesn't succumb entirely. The data mine doesn't generate its own imperatives. These are imported from elsewhere. If, you know, it, when Chris Anderson was saying the numbers speak for themselves, <laughs> that's questionable. But of course, what questions are being asked that they're responding to? That's not something I, I think that, that they can generate. Uh, uh, these questions are imported from elsewhere and imposed by those who control the databases and the networks. And that's why I think the attention to infrastructure is important um, and, and worth um, thinking more about. Uh, the data link, uh, or the back end of the drone array, and of course the server farms. Uh, the era of automated data mining thus augurs what, what I describe as a drone divide between those who operate and control the network infrastructure that enables the convenience and ubiquity of locative media and those who carry the sensors with them, generating the data as they go. That's it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so for uh, just general discussion, so I'm sure there'll be plenty of uh, questions, but also fantastic details and very uh, uh, 
clear uh, set of arguments being developed. I think they're very interesting. So, Mike. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. Uh, I'm reminded of, if you think about autonomous attack, attack agents in a digital network, I'm reminded of viruses, which can mm. go and do different things. So, I mean, that's a metaphor that you were calling for additional metaphors. Ah, so yeah. A virus can replicate itself, whereas I don't think you drones can, but they can um, do, they're more, I mean, active, but I think in some ways a virus encompasses a drone maybe, because they can do it, but within a digital network, because drones are in the physical world as well. So maybe that's a metaphor or a, 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 an analogy that could be useful to think about, because it's just about spreading out, yeah. and a virus is just the best kind of agent, the best kind of program, because they travel the best around the network. Right? Yeah. They replicate themselves and they spread. So I guess um, in some ways there's some kind of you know, analogy there or something. Like that. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I, uh, that's, I think you're right. It is, it is an interesting metaphor to think of some of these things. Um, I, I go back and forth on this idea of metaphor. I, I, like, so for, for drones, I'm trying to think of it more as shared logic than metaphor, but it's very hard to resist that f slipping into metaphor. You know, some places that, that look slightly different, well, uh, you know, the, the thing that's really important to me about the, the drone logic example is the way it turns attention to infrastructure. And viruses actually, are, they do something quite tricky when you think about infrastructure. So they piggyback on existing infrastructures. Uh, or this develop to test the capacity of networks. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, like you can increase the load and you can make them travel and they, they can be um, used for negative purposes, but they <coughs> don't have to be. Just, it's just a way of testing the, the other network. Right? Well, in some ways, well, uh, tell me what you think of this. Um, uh, viruses look to me like potentially, if you wanted to frame it this way, as a more subversive or more portable or less asymmetric um, form of of whatever is they're doing, in the sense that um, you know, the, the drones often get portrayed as like as as a as something that's because they're small and portable, and you can go buy one for you know 100 bucks at uh, at the local shop. That you know, oh, they have they partake of this kind of quote unquote democratizing character of of new technologies. But what I'm trying to argue is they don't, because it's the data link, stupid, right? Whereas viruses, actually, they, they really do operate in that, like, like, you don't need a whole lot of infrastructure to, to create, you know, you need a fair amount of expertise, I guess. But uh, if you unleash it in, you know, in a particular way, then you can rely on the existing infrastructure to allow it to proliferate and do its thing. Um, so, I mean, that, so that's one of the, th that's one of the ways in which you know, I might differentiate the two, but, but I do think, yeah, I, I also think it is useful, I, 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 another useful approach to, to thinking about some of these things that are going on. Yeah. I'm interested to hear what you think about um, the, the possibility for, for these kinds of technologies to, to open up um, new feedbacks, so it has especially uh, cultural feedbacks because it's a human system, so um, the interaction between people and their culture and this new system of, of data and um, ubiquity, I suppose. Um, uh, it seems that it can open up new possibilities for, for feedback loops which can go places that we don't imagine. Yeah, I, I mean, in a sense, what I'm talking about the whole time is feedback. But have you got an example in mind, or are you thinking? Uh, well, I, I guess what got me thinking about it was um, addiction or addictive behavior. Uh, yeah. So when you were talking about, you know, you're walking through the supermarket, through the um, shopping center and, and it takes you to a place, um, if, if the thing it's trying to sell you is something that you're, a, you're on the edge of having an addictive behavior about, it will reinforce that behavior and then, then you'll be stuck into it and you'll spend all of your energy on that. Huh. Huh. Um, for example. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Well, I, I, I guess what you're raising really is this um, issue around <laughs> If we take some of this stuff seriously, <laughs> and I'll put, you know, I think that if is important, but um, uh, the whole register of affective information collection and affective um, triggers in terms of responses, 
what it's really trying to get at in some ways, uh, although I think there's some caveats here, is, is bypassing f forms of conscious registration and, and deliberation, or at least to take the marketing example, that's certainly the type of thing that marketers are talking about all the time. You, you don't make rational decisions. Your purchasing decisions aren't rational. They are driven by something that uh, it takes place in another dimension. And we can measure that. And we can detect it. And we can trigger it. Right? Now, I, I, there, are different, there are different theories of how, uh, from what I, I'm not an expert on this, but you know, I look at some of the neuroscience people I've been reading some of this. They have different theories about how that relationship works. Um, but if you, you know, it, marketers like that particular idea that um, uh, in an era of messaging overload, your decisions are, are made in ways that, you know, they're, they're pop cultural manifestations of this, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Blink or, or, um, uh, or, or forms of uh, uh, some of the um, experiments that he relies on upon uh, that where you make judgments that are actually uh, take place in it, uh, without um, engaging the forms of rational cl critical deliberation associated with conscious control. So if you take all that stuff seriously um, and you think about it in a particular way, you're right, you raise, you know, what type of a world are you envisioning in, in which um, that is going to be considered, I, uh, sorry, slight digression, but it's an interesting question. Um, I've looked at some of the neuromarketing research. And, and so they locate the truth of your desire in your neurological response. So they'll say things like, um, well, we, focus to, we, we ask people, uh, this is just an example that springs to mind. Uh, who's that, do you remember that actor, The Rock, Dwayne, somebody or other? They, they did some, he's an American professional wrestler. Uh, and they, they asked um, viewers whether or not they liked him. And, and apparently, one of the things they found out was that female viewers tended to say, they didn't like him, but something in their response when they put EEGs or, or whatever they were doing on them indicated in a particular part of the brain that's correlated with, I don't know, arousal or however they were framing it, it indicated that they did like him. <laughs> and so they said, so, so their claim was, you may say you don't, but the truth of your desire is you do. And, you know, how do you, how do you verify that? You know, the proof is in the pudding for the marketers, right? Or is it in the pudding? In the eating? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> you know, like what movies sell to which audiences? But, but it, it's interesting where they're locating the truth. of the, they're, And they're thinking in that particular way. Yeah, did you want to get in on that? <laughs> Yes. Well, that, that's, what I, I, that's one of the things I'm trying to get at with this notion at the end of a big data divide. You know, we've been talking a lot for the past two days about big data sets and what you do with them. And because of, I think, where we are and, and for a number of reasons, we've looked a lot at, at public databases. But of course, some of the biggest databases these days are private databases that are com controlled by commercial entities who have different imperatives. <laughs> and and that's, that's where I think the infrastructure question becomes really important. Who owns and operates this, these infrastructures and what are the imperatives that drive them? Uh, but I think you're right. Yeah. Sorry, you wanted to get in on that. Yeah. I was just going to come on that point. There's a well-known phenomenon um, called the mere exposure hypothesis, which um, the basic idea is that we, it's not just that our attitudes and preferences drive our behavior. We learn what our preferences are from our behavior. Huh. And so if you've got a situation like this where your suit or whatever it is or, you know, is driving you to be exposed <laughs> repeatedly to product A, the mere fact that you're exposed to product A repeatedly over time will enhance your liking of it. Hmm. And so what these things can do, what these systems can do, the feedback loops that they can create is a kind of runaway feedback loop. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, that's scary. It seems counterproductive. <laughs> Thanks. It, it kind of changes the whole game. <laughs> In there as the chair just asked you a question around. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in uh, how what you just said relates to um, a sense of distrust of subjective experience to be able to know itself. I've heard a lot in the last day and a half too about how um, tech there's technologies available to quantify the self. I a lot from we were speaking about that earlier. To train the self, to reveal itself, to know itself, to map itself, to improve itself sustain itself. 
So I'm interested in uh, this kind of bypassing that level of consciousness to a materiality of the body where truth is seen to lie. But at the same time, there seems to be a training process. That the body is kind of used as a source of truth, uh, but also a mode of training. And I just wondered if, if you had a, a sense of that kind of relation of distrust and truth or as it relates to the body and a, a desire to, put, to uh, bypass that kind of layer of contrived subjectivity. Yeah. Okay, wow. Okay, big question. <laughs> Let me, I'll try to come at it in... in, in <laughs> I'll try to come at it in... in I, I mean, the way I've been thinking about it is, um, you know, where is the distrust located? Right? So, uh, and you can get at that maybe some different ways. But the type of the direction I've been pushing at here is, is um, um, the, at least we'll take some of these neurological examples. The, the trust is in, if you look at, at the neuromarketing, right? It's, it's in these kind of patterns of physiological response. If you're looking at the big data mining stuff, it's in the, it's in the data patterns, right? Which is a kind of, if you really wanted to push that, I guess, to some kind of a limit, um, I suppose you could say something like a certain conception of the subject is, is bypassed there. I, I, I think it's interesting, I don't know if you, some of you guys may know Alex Pentland, he's, he's one of the um, data scientists at MIT and he was named as like the seven most influential data scientists of, globally, or whatever that means. Um, uh, and data scientist, by the way, you may know, is like the sexiest career of the 21st century, according to... So that makes him the seventh sexiest <laughs> guy. But all that aside, um, uh, he said, you, what you, sh you shouldn't look at what people say. He was kind of dismissing um, this Twitter and Facebook and sentiment mining. He said, you look at what people do. That's the data that w we're interested in, that, that we mine. Well, it, what, okay, so where is distrust located there? You know, it's, it's not what you say, it's, it's what, what you do. Uh, and and wh why, I, this gets it that what I describe as a kind of like post-narrative. I was really interested in Fleur's focus on lists because I think that, you know, the list is, as displacing narrative is an interesting thing to, to, to look at. Um, but, you know, whence this kind of mistrust of, of what people say, of the narratives, of the stories? I, you know, that's a, a whole another set of explanations. But, you know, uh, one way that I tend to think about it is w when you live in a world of proliferating narratives, you know, like the internet, just imagine the, the, the way the internet operates. This is an area that interests me, as you, as you probably know. Um, you know, kind of dominant narratives get broken down in certain ways by the logics of, of information circulation and, and distribution. So you, you can have like folks in the U.S. Um, who, uh, you know, the birther conspiracy folks guys, you can tell them a dominant narrative over and over again. Barack Obama showed his birth certificate, he's not a Muslim, he wasn't born in Kenya, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter because they have circulating counter narratives on the internet of all kinds that prove that the birth certificate is a forgery. And so you end up in this weird world where the internet that was supposed to be once upon a time in, in some particular imaginings of it, this is the source that's going to create the informed populace that now is able to, to use, uh, to find out, you know, kind of hyper-enlightenment narrative. Now everybody has access to the ability to arrive at a kind of convergent truth. But it, it, you know, it didn't, doesn't work out that way or hasn't yet. <laughs> um, in, it's actually worked in different ways. So wh what happens to the fate of narrative in that world of hyper-proliferation of narratives. Well, you've got to find some way to cut through it. And, and, that's, and that maybe that raises that question of, okay, so where are you going to put your trust? In the patterns, in the bodies, in the in materiality. The narratives are multiplying too fast, they're too crazy, they seem indeterminate every time, you know, each one proliferates more. I, you know, and there, there are folks in the theory world who I think have, you know, contributed to that. The, 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 the whole uh, ways in which um, narrative and discourse are, have, have been situated. So there's a big story there. I don't know if that gets it, what you're talking about. But, I, but it's interesting to me, it's a great question. You know, why this fascination with materiality? What's, what's behind it? Um, uh, and I, I think some of those factors might be related to it. This might be a sort of naive, stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> um, I mean, part of what you're talking about is a way, uh, in, 
different types of technologies for gathering knowledge in, in a range of ways, right? And part of that, or a lot of what you talked about is how this may take place in commercial settings, like you have the slider with, with Apple iPhones or whatever, or surveillance, with, you know, with the state surveilling populations in certain ways and so forth. Uh, I was just wondering, what about academia itself? Uh, you know, will a drone logic sort of... <laughs> Oh yeah. I'm thinking of the GIS, is a good example. Yeah. Like that was, it's, it's used a lot in the military, but uh, yeah. many academics use GIS as well, right? So will we see, uh, you know, I'm from anthropology as well, will future PhD students just be given a drone and then you start doing field work? <laughs> I love that question. You know, I've learned, whenever people say, like, this may be a stupid question, it's going to be a good one. So, <laughs> so, so I, I've kind of, uh, I, think that's a, I think it's a great question. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the ways in that which that might operate. And I, I'll just give you an example that jumped to mind. I was reading somewhere, um, there, I don't know if there's anybody from the digital humanities here, I, I think not. <laughs> Somebody writing about the digital humanities and they, they were very excited about it. And, and what they were talking about was, I, I can't remember what it was. For example, let's say it was um, 19th century French literature or something. But they're saying, you know, what we can do is we can data mine this stuff now um, and we can find out all kinds of stuff without having to read it, <laughs> which, which I think is a beautiful example of the kind of post-narrative thrust, right? Like, mm -hmm. s this is so cool. We can actually displace the whole trajectory of what the study of literature has been about, thanks to the fact that now what we have is the ability, you know, this might be pushing the drone logic a little bit, but you'll see, it, I hope it connects to some of the stuff I've been saying. You know, you can basically send these probes out through all of the literature, you know, uh, and f find patterns of, of, uh, that emerge from that that allow you, I'm sure they're going to find some stuff will be pretty, really pretty interesting, <laughs> but it's, it's a kind of like post-narratival literature studies or something might be one way. <laughs> but you know, anthropology, boy, I don't know, I, you could probably come up with better examples than I can, but there are probably all kinds of interesting ways in which you could just distribute drones. You don't have to go do field work. And just, uh, but I, that would violate a whole bunch of the ethos of, of what it means to to, to be an anthropologist, so uh, I'm sure there'll be all kinds of cultural resistance there. But I, have you got some examples that you're well, thinking no, so about? I don't, I, I just, <laughs> while we were yeah. talking, I just thought, you know, my, you know, this would be a really scary justification of a college to cut out the project, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, don't give them any ideas. <laughs> While you just responded, I just one example of this perhaps uh, uh, is uh, some bibliographic software, like, uh, I don't know if you have a Mendeley. They can actually do, um, it's a bit like, if you know, the genius, or I, what is it, iGenius? You know, in iTunes, uh -huh. they, they can work out your patterns in terms of uh, music, and therefore recommend you new songs and so forth. A bit like Pandora, well, like you mentioned, and Mendeley does that for literature. Ah. So it will analyze your bibliography, or your, your database, basically, and then recommend academic papers. Huh. Which is also a bit sort of, you know, beyond the narrative, so to speak. Well, uh, yeah, oh, uh, sorry, I, while you're talking, I just thought of another example, too, that kind of gets in the direction, uh, maybe more ethnography than anthropology, but um, one of the things that Pentland does is he equips cell phones with special sensors and he gives them to, like, grad students who are participating in his research. And then he just studies everything that they do. And he comes up with kind of interesting findings. So he's able to, uh, and again, you know, so, so this I think really fits with the type of stuff I'm talking about. I can't remember what the sensors he's equipped them with. But, um, and again, this was several years back. I'm sure this is kind of old news now. But he was able to figure out when they were getting sick before they knew they were getting sick based on their patterns, uh, their usage patterns. Something happened that was distinctive prior to them getting sick, that when it happened again was a pretty good predictor of them getting sick. He was also able to do something which I thought was kind of interesting, which was infer content of conversations from metadata. So Edward Snowden and company, right? Uh, um, so he didn't, he wasn't tracking the content of their conversations, but through, I guess, who they were talking to, length of the conversation, patterns of, of conversation. He was able to figure out whether they were talking about politics or something personal. So he was able to make some inferences about the content. Um, and that doesn't really get, uh, I guarantee you, academics are going to be doing that a lot, right? There's, there are going to be, there's going to be grant after grant after funded project after funded project of putting distributed data collection devices in populations and getting information about them. That's uh, clearly a, a, a big 
area, uh, research direction. So I, I, that, and that I'd call it, yeah, I don't know, call it droning of research or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Because they like the, um, the subliminal uh, reaction from us rather than we have a rational choice to buy something and then we won't buy anything. But we buy compulsory, so we buy things we don't need. <laughs> we didn't want it. Uh, but I think I like the idea also correlated definitely with infrastructure because you have a, even you have a lot of patterns identified, you have to still make a narrative meaning out of pattern otherwise Use, no, no use, yeah. Yeah. Because it, I, I also agree with the, your idea of trusting because data itself has no truth or the trust or distrust. So we, what we get in pattern, make meaning out of, then you have a question of whether I trust this pattern of the interpretation is whether you trust the interpretation of the pattern. I think that's a different direction. Yeah? Yeah, well, a number of things to say. I mean, I, I think you're right. A, a lot of what we've been talking about for these past couple of days is, you know, can you trust the patterns? And, and that's a lot of the ways in which um, big data mining or big data as a concept kind of gets attacked. You know, well, why big data? Maybe you, you'll get um, more robust results or more usable results actually from smaller data sets. What's, what's the hype around it? Um, and you know, I guess one thing you could say is maybe the jury's out on that yet, or maybe his techniques still need to be developed. But it, it also comes, you know, there, there are contexts in which those types of questions become irrelevant because you're, you don't really have a representational model where you're trying to describe something and figure out whether you're accurately describing it. You're just engaged in monitoring processes and seeing how they work. So, I, I, and what would be an example of that? Something like, um, I don't know, you might tell me if you agree with this, but you know, Google's, uh, the way in which their advertising system works, yeah. where they're able, you know, it's just these kind of flows of data that they're harvesting. You know, you tweak an ad here, you put a message here differently, different and you get... Data, yeah. You can create a different uh, pattern. It yeah. when we click, click, depends on, I'm, I'm a different manufacturer, I'm selling different things, you can <laughs> tweak it. And you can have another one for a paper ice, ice cream seller. <laughs> well, well and, they, and they constantly do. Yeah, yeah. And then they just see which, you know, what tweaks correlate with what yeah. behaviors. And they have such a large volume and, and, uh, and, you know, a kind of continuous ongoing experiment that they can kind of adjust it. And, and you know, questions of certain types of referentiality or, or, I don't know, cleanness of the data, I'm not sure it quite applies to that particular uh, use of a uh, form of data processing, but I might be wrong about that. But just say one more thing about capitalism, I, sorry, because um, that interests me a lot. The, um, you know, the, I, I was really interested by Pascal's presentation earlier because, you know, what was behind it was, was this kind of perfect rationalization of flows, of everything, right, of, of you know, products on railroads, of energy flowing around, of, of people through traffic, you know, all of these different flows. How can you perfect those flows? And sometimes, you know, behind this stuff, a lot of what I've been describing clearly has marketing imperatives, but a lot of it has that kind of logic of pure rationalization, right? How do you get everything to flow faster, better, more efficiently? Then that, that's Bill Gates's fascination with friction-free capitalism or frictionless security. Or, they, yeah, sorry, Google Glass, you know, there's an, there's an app somebody developed for Google Glass that will um, use facial recognition technology to match, if you're in a party in a room, match somebody's face with all the available, like, or, or, or all of the dating networks that have signed on to it, and, <laughs> and see whether that person has a profile that matches elements of your express profile. But it's this kind of like perfection of, you know, like, the problem is, is lack of information, is imperfect information. And what big data promises is uh, not the perfection, but you know, moving towards the, the perfection of information. And that eliminates all kinds of um, uh, friction, all kinds of things that slow down. You know, like in a, in, a, in a party, in a room, there may be somebody that you, know, you guys would really get, get, to, um, get along, but you just don't have the available information. But the infrastructure might have it and might be able to, but that recurs over and over, this kind of like fascination with efficiency. And that's almost, 
that's like less Marxist critique of capitalism and more Weber's critique of rationalization or so, something. I, I, I don't know, sociologists here can maybe speak to that, but I, um, I, it's not unrelated, I think, to capitalism. But I'm fascinated by that fetishization of perfect efficiency. In a lot of ways, it, it's wonderful. If you could get rid of traffic jams, great. Uh, or if you can find your, you know, your loved one <laughs> faster, better, <laughs> why not?